From Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 10, recorded on July 27, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, Cutting to the Chase on Important Health Topics. Today, Paul, I'd like to take a closer look at your post called Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Should Stop Talking About Vaccines. The presidential candidate now claims that the polio vaccine killed more people than it saved. So, Paul, I've studied polio for over 40 years. What am I missing? You're not missing anything. Um, what he did was took something where there was a kernel of truth, which is often true in these anti-vaccine tropes, that there's a kernel of truth, but it's just completely uh, misrepresented and exaggerated or taken to its illogical end. And, and that's what happened here. So he was on, uh, RFK Jr. was on uh, Lex Fridman's podcast where Fridman um, asked him about vaccines and in, what he said in general that he didn't think any vaccine really was, had, uh, was worth it where the benefits outweigh the risks. So what Friedman did was he thought, okay, here's a man who was, you know, who's 69 years old. He lived through the polio times. His parents were worried about polio, his getting polio, his brothers and sisters getting polio. I'll ask about polio vaccines. So he said, well, what about polio? And RFK Jr. said basically that, that uh, many, many, in his words, uh, like about six many's, many, 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 many more people were hurt by the polio vaccine than saved by it. And the number he gave was 98 million. And by her what he meant was cancers, that, that that vaccine caused cancer in tens of millions of people. And um, it's wrong. But it was based on um, something that had a kernel of truth. Right. And I'm sure that kernel of truth has to do with another virus, right? Right. So, so um, when Jonas Salk made his vaccine or Albert Sabin made his vaccine, Salk made his vaccine by taking polio virus, growing it up in monkey kidney cells, purifying it, killing it with formaldehyde. Sabin made his vaccine by growing uh, polio virus in monkey kidney cells or monkey testicular cells and then weakening it by serial passage in these monkey cells. So that was a live weakened form of the virus. Um, but in both cases, they used live monkeys that were then brought to this country, sacrificed, and then their kidneys, in this case, were removed. Um, what was discovered fairly quickly was that, um, and it was really Bernice Eddy at the FDA, who saw there was this, in her words, vacuolating agent. There was this agent in those cells that seemed to cause vacuoles in the, in the cells. And she didn't know what it was, but she, she knew that there was some agent that was doing that. Maurice Hillman actually identified that as being a virus. And, and it was the 40th virus, monkey virus, that was identified. So it was called simian virus 40. So that was worrisome. Here you had a, an unknown virus that was um, contaminating both of these vaccines, both the Salk vaccine and the Sabin vaccine, because they used, both used these monkey kidney cells. Um, and then, then an experiment was done by both Bernice Eddy and Maurice Hilleman, uh, where they inoculated experimental animals like guinea pigs or hamsters, and found that when they injected them with this, this virus, that they could cause cancers, cancers under the skin, as well as certain um, organ-related uh, cancers like lung, uh, brain, uh, kidney, liver, et cetera. So that scared them. Here you, you now knew that tens of thousands of, of people, mostly children in the United States, were inoculated with, with this vaccine, this polio vaccine, that was contaminated with SV40 virus. Now, the uh, Sabin vaccine wasn't yet licensed in this country. That didn't really happen starting until really 61, 62 in there, and then the trivalent by 63. But, um, but nonetheless, millions of people in Russia had been inoculated with Sabin's vaccine. So, so did this vaccine cause cancer in children? Now, there were a number of studies that were reassuring. One is that, that Jonas Salk inactivated his vaccine with formaldehyde, which also inactivated SV40. So that was, that was reassuring. We know this because people tried those conditions on SV40 and showed that they inactivated it. 
That's right. That there was at least a ten thousand fold decrease in titers with uh, with the formaldehyde. So formaldehyde not only inactivated polio, it also inactivated this virus. And so SV40 is a polyoma virus. It's a non enveloped, uh, double stranded circular DNA icosahedral virus. But it too was inactivated. This polyoma virus was also inactivated by uh, formaldehyde. But Sabin's vaccine wasn't treated with formaldehyde. I mean, children were likely inoculated with SV40. Um, what was reassuring in the animal model studies is you really had to inject SV40 uh, under the skin in order or in the muscle to get those cancers. It, 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 the animals that ingested it, that ate it, didn't develop those cancers. And Sabin's vaccine was uh, swallowed, not injected. So that was reassuring. Um, but still, you didn't really know. And so what was done then, I would argue that in the early 1960s, SV40 was one of the best studied mammalian viruses in the United States. We were scared to death of what what we had just done, that we had just inadvertently inoculated uh, children with a cancer-causing vaccine. But it was reassuring that, 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 uh, the, that when you looked at, for example, the children who were inoculated with Sabin's vaccine, that they never appeared to develop an antibody response to SV40, suggesting that the virus just passed through the intestine without causing an infection. And so then studies were done to see whether there was an increased risk of cancer in children who got polio vaccines as compared to those who didn't. And those studies were done five years later, eight years later, 15 years later, now 35 years later. They were done in the United States. They were also done in, in um, the UK, in, uh, in Sweden, and um, in, in Germany. So, um, and again, same result. So, 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 so then we could breathe a sigh of relief that, that, that what we feared was a cancer-causing vaccine in people wasn't. Nonetheless, there is RFK Jr. now, you know, decades later, sounding a bell that had largely been largely been silent, silenced by studies that showed that that wasn't a cancer causing virus in people. So I, I don't know if you can answer this, but does he know this or does he not know that uh, it, it, it's been shown that it is not associated with human cancers? Um, I don't think he cares one way or the other. I think his job is to scare people. And so any anything he can do to scare people, he will do it. Um, the goal is to make it so that vaccines are no longer mandated. And obviously, you're not going to mandate any vaccine if it's unsafe or if it's perceived to be unsafe, which is actually a different thing. But um, that's his goal. I don't think he cares. I, I mean, I think you could you could sit him down and he could quietly listen to, to what you say that here, here's all these studies. That, that should calm your fears that this ever was a cancer-causing virus, and he would listen to you, and then he would go and continue to say it. Because that's been true for everything else he said. I mean, he continues to say the MMR vaccine causes cancer. And, you know, I think it's reasonable to ask the question, right? I mean, when 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 this 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 issue was raised in the late 1990s with Andrew Wakefield's paper that the MMR vaccine might be associated with uh, autism. It's fair to ask the question, right? My child was fine. They got this vaccine. Now they have autism. Could that have been from the vaccine? Well, that is an answerable question. You can answer that question in a scientific venue. And it has been answered again and again and again, yet he still says it. So I think that's the answer to your question. It doesn't matter whether data refutes what he says. He's just on a promotional campaign to scare people about vaccines. So let me just have you say it again. There is no evidence that uh, giving people SV40 and the polio vaccines has led to any cancers in humans. That's right. I think now we know with, with three decades worth of epidemiological studies that that was never a problem. And, and frankly, reassuring animal model studies, when you looked at, at uh, how we knew that the, the fact that the polio vaccine of SALKS was inactivated, we know that the, uh, and that, that that also inactivated SV40. We know that the Sabin vaccine, um, although not inactivated, uh, did seem to induce an antibody response. And remember, this, this, this agent was no longer in vaccines by the early 1960s. I mean, once we realized that, I mean, I mean, we obviously now knew what to look for. And so the cells, substrates that were used in both of those vaccines no longer contain that agent. We're talking in a, about an event that happened in the late 50s and early 60s and, and, and was never a problem beyond that. So we, we're dealing with now more than 60 years worth of data. So when, when this was first discovered, did the U.S. or other countries try and cover up the fact that this had happened? 
Not at all. Dr. Hillman stood up in front of a national and international meeting and said, look, here's what I found. And it was incredibly upsetting to people, especially Albert Sabin, who, who, who didn't have an inactivated vaccine, who now we know did inoculate, you know, many people, millions of people in Russia with a potential cancer causing virus. And that's why it was so well studied. I mean, give credit to the academic community, give credit to the public health community for putting it out there. Look, this is what we just found. Let's see whether or not we did harm. And we didn't. Um, so, um, I think you should get a lot of credit for that, for that openness, for that transparency. Could could a similar event happen today with a new vaccine? Sure, absolutely. I, I think it's always possible. I mean, there were a, a question about porcine circovirus as a consequence of rotavirus vaccines because um, rotaviruses um, require um, a, it's a biological, and it's hard to get the biologicals out of biological. So there was a a, uh, a bovine trypsin that was used to, because that sort of activates the virus and allows it to enter cells. Uh, you have to cut that one of the surface proteins of rotavirus to allow it to enter cells. It's similar, actually, for uh, SARS-CoV-2, and um, and that was contaminated with a um, a uh, Bovine, with a circovirus, I was a porcine circovirus, it's porcine trypsin, um, which it was actually an orphan virus. It actually doesn't even cause uh, uh, disease in pigs. But nonetheless, I mean, it was still, it's always possible. I think it's, it's impossible to get the biologicals out of biologicals. There are always, it's always the potential that there are agents we don't know about that you'll find. And, and fortunately, I think we the studies that are done are so rigorous these days that uh, that you're going to find out if it's a problem. If, if there's a problem, you'll find out about it. I mean, when people say to me, you know, I don't trust pharmaceutical companies or I don't trust the FDA. You really don't have to. I mean, there are systems in place once vaccines are out there, like vaccine adverse events reporting system, vaccine safety data link, that will pick up problems if they're there. Uh, and I think COVID vaccines are a perfect example. I mean, those pre-licensure trials were not big enough to pick up myocarditis with mRNA vaccines or pick up bleeding associated with uh, Johnson & Johnson's vectored virus vaccines, but that was quickly picked up uh, post, post approval because uh, we had systems in place to do that. I think I think we should be proud of that, and I think we we have that with on the vaccine side much more so on the drug side because we give vaccines to healthy children, healthy young children, so they're held to a very high standard of of, of safety. I, I wish there was a drug safety data link. I think we would have found out, for example, that Vioxx was a rare cause of heart attacks much more quickly than we did. So I've heard uh, people saying that there's SV40 in COVID vaccines and. They're, they must be just using the, the polio story to make it up, right? Right. No, there's there's not SV40 in any any current vaccines. We learned that lesson. But you, you do learn as you go. There's never, um, anytime you have a, a, a medical product, by whether it's a drug or a biological that has a positive effect, there's always a possibility of a negative effect. There's always something that you, you're you surprised by. I mean, the, I mean, I'm at Penn, you know, where the gene, gene uh, therapies uh, caused the death of a boy named Jesse Gelsinger. And you'd think, okay, well, that's, we've learned that lesson, but that wasn't true either. I mean, there was uh, researchers in France who used retroviruses as a way to, to insert a gene that ended up causing leukemia in, in four of the 10 people who were inoculated. So, you know, it's, it's the um, painful practice. We wrote a book about this called You Bet Your Life, um, which just made the point that um, the that medical innovation is invariably associated with some human price. The only question is uh, how big of how big of a price and how common. Well, uh, Doctor Offa, you're simply giving uh, ammunition to people who say, "I want to choose what I put in my body." What's the argument for still being vaccinated, for example, despite all this that you have said? Sure. There's no risk-free choices. It would be nice if there was a risk-free choice. That work out that way. So you see, you say, okay, look, I'm not going to get this COVID vaccine because I may be one of the one in fifty thousand that gets myocarditis, or I'm not going to be uh, one of those people that gets the J and J vaccine early on because I might be one of those one in two hundred thousand that um, that had a bleed. Um, but the virus does it too, and the virus does it far more commonly. So. That's that's the, the the issue. The virus is is far more likely to cause these problems than is this the very modified form of the virus. Yeah, you know, I think that's in the end the key that needs to be understood. That infection is always worse uh, than yes. uh, any rare side effect caused by the vaccine. But maybe people don't understand that. No, I think it's the sin of omission versus the sin of commission. I think I think something that you do to yourself or your child that causes harm is seen as much worse than if you don't do anything and harm is caused to you. Um, 
it's just perceived as worse. Um, but it's not. I mean, if it's if uh, if it happens, it's a problem. And and I remember with the rotavirus vaccine, when Rota Shield came onto the market, uh, which was a bovine human reassortant vaccine that was made by Wyeth um, in collaboration with researchers at NIH, um, that came onto the market in the sort of late nineties. Was on the market for about ten months. It was found to be a rare cause of intussusception, which is intestinal blockage. Um, and so it was actually the company took that off the market before the. ACIP ever voted on that. This is in the late 90s. And, um, but if you just looked at the odds of, say, dying from um, the rotavirus vaccine as compared to dying from the, the, the virus, you had a five to tenfold greater risk of dying from the virus than dying from the vaccine. But, but again, it was this sort of sin of omission versus sin of commission. If this caused any safety problem, even if the benefits outweighed the risks, um, it was perceived as worse. And so it came off the market. Well, Paul, I don't think this is the last we're going to hear of uh, RFK Jr., uh, as, especially on Beyond the Noise. But uh, that's it for today. You can find Beyond the Noise on Substack. We'll put a link in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you.